Good evening. I'm Monica McCain Sanchez, and this is CB8 Speaks. This is a monthly program about Community Board 8 in Manhattan. Uh, it's um, about the interest and the concerns of residents and businesses in the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. The Upper East Side being East 59th Street to East 96th Street from East River to um, Fifth Avenue. Community boards are representative bodies for volunteers in New York City. Uh, they are appointed by the borough president in consultation with the city council. Community, uh, Manhattan has 12 community boards and they play an advisory ro role in zoning, land use, community planning budgets, and the coordination of municip municipal services. Please visit our website at www.cb8m.com. Tonight, we are very honored to have our guest, Jonathan Bing, the New York State Assembly Member for the 73rd District, which encompasses the Upper East Side, East Midtown, Sutton Place, and Turtle Bay. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Monica. Assemblyman Bing has represented the 73rd District since 2002, and he's authored over 60 pieces of legislation. And of those, 24 have been signed into law. He chairs a task force of people with disabilities. He's a member of six other committees, which are very important to the residents of Community Board 8, as well to uh, of New York City as a whole and to New York State. These committees are health, housing, insurance, judiciary, social services, and tourism, parks, arts, and sports. So um, anyway, we want to get started a little bit about you, um, about why you s ran for public office to begin with. Well, back in the spring of 2001, I was a practicing lawyer in New York. Um, I was a member of Community Board 6, the Community Board just to the south of Community Board 8. Uh, I grew. I, I was living in the district in which I had grown up on, on the Upper East Side, and really decided that uh, I had always had an interest in politics. I had started working on Capitol Hill uh, during the summer when I was 16 years old, mm -hmm. uh, and I had always had an interest in running for office and, and giving back to the community that had done so much for me. So back in the spring of 2001, I said if I ever was going to run for office, this was the time to do it. I geared up to run um, against then uh, Assemblyman John Ravitz. Uh, the fall of 2001, of course, New York City experienced such a great tragedy with 9-11. Uh, uh, I took some time off from running for office to coordinate the Disaster Legal Services Program for the American Bar Association and, and FEMA. Then af uh, after six months of doing that, returned in the spring of 2002, uh, geared up to run for office. Assemblyman Ravitz decided not to run for re-election, uh, competed in a very, in a very highly fought uh, primary for the Democratic nomination in September of that year, had uh, very, probably the most expensive uh, general election uh, that the Assembly has ever seen in that fall, and mm -hmm. was able to uh, uh, to eke out a victory that fall, and have uh, been uh, fortunate enough to be re-elected three times since then, and I've really found it to be a very rewarding experience. Now, you have a legal background, mm -hmm. and um, we were wondering if this is a common background for members of the Assembly. It is the most common background, but it is not as common as it used to be. Uh, back uh, in the 200 plus year uh, history of the New York State Legislature, back in the early days, pretty much every legislator was also an attorney. Th to this point, you still have the attorney being the number one profession for members of the legislature, but it's not as ma many as it used to be as a percentage of, of the whole body. So you have uh, people from varied backgrounds, whether it's uh, tavern owners, farmers, accountants, uh, social service personnel, really a, w a wider variety of, uh, of professions than had existed in the past, with lawyers still being number one, but not by as much as it used to be. Now, you're on quite a few committees, and there are actually a vast number in the uh, New York State government. How are uh, members of the Assembly assigned to these mm -hmm. committees or appointed? When I took office, the Speaker asked me for my recommendations for my for what committees I would want to be assigned to, and I was very pleased that that the Speaker did assign to me pretty much all the committees that I had been trying to uh, secure for myself, uh, including health, housing, judiciary, and, and judiciary. Uh, they change over time a little bit. Uh, this year, I was appointed to the uh, to the insurance committee. Insurance being a very important industry on the east side, whether it's for the corporations that are located here or the professionals that are employed by them. Uh, so they do sometimes change over time, and sometimes they're related to issues that are specific to the district. Uh, tourism was another committee that I strongly fought to secure a place on because re have, representing the Museum Mile, tourism and the arts is so important to uh, the lifeblood of my constituency, both in terms of jobs as well as, as quality of life, that uh, it was very important for me to secure a spot on that committee, and, and I'm pleased that I've had the opportunity to 
uh, be on the Tourism Committee for the seven years I've been in office. Is there a limit to the number of committees you can be on? Uh, about, so we are we we are assigned six committees at the outset, and that's pretty much the uh, the, the 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 highest number. Others who have chairmanships of, of of significant committees may only be on be on two or three, depending on on how much time that committee takes. How do subcommittees operate? Subcommittees, it's a little bit different from the way they operate in Congress. It's not the same sort of feeder system uh, from subcommittees to the general committee then then along the line. But they they are concentrated in areas of expertise that the committee wants to focus on. For instance, I was the chairman of the subcommittee on Mitchell Lama Housing on the, of the Housing Committee. I'm a member of the Housing Committee, and uh, Chairman Lopez asked me a couple years ago to be the chair of the subcommittee on Mitchell Lama Housing because that was an area that the Housing Committee wanted to focus on in terms of legislation and advocacy. Uh, just recently, I was moved from that position to being the chair of the task force of people with disabilities. And task forces are not not part of the committee structure, but they're organizations uh, or committee or task forces put together by the speaker on issues that he wants to make sure the assembly is taking a lead on. And people with disabilities is such an important issue for all of New York that uh, I'm very pleased to take on this position. And it's been a, a position that has been held by a number of uh, Manhattan representatives in the past, including former Assemblyman and now Borough President Scott Stringer. So there's a, a great line of advocacy for people with disabilities from representatives from Manhattan. Well, there are a lot of committees you're on, obviously because of the issues. And certainly in Manhattan and, and the Upper East Side, there are many, many issues. What do you think are, if you had to prioritize, the most mm -hmm. pressing issues that that um, you um, are um, facing as being a, a representative to the state government? Well, I think the east side is no different from the rest of the state in terms of the big ticket issues that we face. It's it's health care, housing, and education. Uh, the issue, but but in terms of local issues, probably the two local issues that I've spent the most time on within recent months are. Construction, Second Avenue subway construction. Uh, last year, the tragedies with the construction uh, crane accidents that I was uh, I've, I've been involved in, in terms of legislation. So, sort of development is one issue, and education specific to the East Side with regard to school building, uh, mm. creating more schools on the East Side. Uh, we have some great schools on the East Side, but they're bursting at the seams, and uh, students are. You know, it's it's going to be, and in many cases ha has gotten to the point that it's difficult for students to lo to learn in classrooms that are 32, 33, 34 students. So, building adequate schools as well as uh, as well as development issues are two of the are two of the local issues in which I'm, I'm most involved. Again. Tourism and the arts is, is a big issue, and this this district, but in both the Senate and the Assembly, has a long-standing bipartisan history of advancing the arts. Senator Goodman, uh, who served this community for for 32 plus years, uh, was a great champion of the arts, and I've looked to fulfill some of that role in during my years in office to really being uh, a great advocate for the arts. Because uh, right now, especially with financial services having so many so many difficulties, arts and tourism is is the main activity that keeps New York City afloat right now. And we really need to put the government uh, backing into it in order to make sure that uh, not just big institutions, but small nonprofit arts institutions are able to survive. Mm. Um, one of the, uh, the big issues that um, has been going on for some time is Second Avenue subway mm -hmm. um, on the, the construction, which is massive. Um, right. I don't think as a, an average citizen realized what was going to happen. Um, and there's actually been a lot of, um, so much construction businesses are closing. Um, do you know if there's any chance Albany can take any action to assist these businesses and the problems they're having? Right. Well, I, I've, I've been trying uh, on both a legislative level as well as on a community level. Last year, I introduced legislation to create a small business grant program for Second Avenue small businesses in the construction zone. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a very well-crafted piece of legislation. It was one-to-one -one match, so every business had to put in a dollar in order to get a, to get a dollar back. Uh, it it, it may, required them to show that business was lost due to the Second Avenue subway construction so that it wasn't something sort of helping businesses that, that had made bad business decisions. It was really related to construction, uh, and it would provide small grants in order to keep these businesses afloat. But a lot of these businesses, it could be a $5,000 grant or a $10,000 grant could be the difference between open, staying open or closing. Uh, this legislation passed the Assembly, it was carried in the Senate by Senator Jose Serrano, passed the Senate last year, uh, unfortunately it was vetoed by Governor Patterson. 
I, I personally can't, I can't understand why. I think it would have been a great, uh, a great thing to do. I think the rationale was that it was setting a precedent for creating a grant program related to a, uh, a government construction project. You know, to me, that's what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. When government and uh, moves forward with a, with a construction project, such as the Second Avenue subway construction, which is something that the people of the state of New York voted for in terms of the Bond Act, something that I support, something that in the long run will be greatly beneficial to the east side, it's our responsibility to make sure that the businesses there are able to cut the ribbon with us when the, when the project completes. Uh, so it was unfortunately vetoed. Again, it was passed in the Assembly this year. It's not passed the Senate yet, uh, but we are working, hopefully before the close of the year in the Senate, to get the legislation back to the governor and try again with neighborhood activism to get him to sign it. But really on a community level, we're doing a lot of work really day to day, keeping the lights on, keeping the, pho keeping the phone on, uh, making sure that, that businesses can get deliveries in a timely manner. That's what really my office is doing on a day-to-day -day basis, working with local businesses. Just the day-to-day the, the -day things that businesses have to think about. But if you're a restaurant and your phone service, your electricity goes out on a Saturday night, you're going to lose thousands of dollars of business. So we do a lot working with the city government, working with local businesses uh, to make sure that all the things, can, can ha that all the things they need to have uh, to, to maintain a business can, can stay open. We're also working with local residents uh, both in terms of major uh, events such as happened a couple of weeks ago where you had some structural difficulties of, of a couple of the buildings that people had to be moved out. Now one of the buildings has been reoccupied, but working with residents in that way again. Um, in the long run, the 2nd Avenue subway is a, must, a much needed new form of transportation on the east side, uh, but we have to make sure that people and businesses are there to cut the ribbon with us when it does open up. So you get a lot of um, uh, contact from the businesses and yes. the residents. Oh, okay. We have, we have yeah. uh, weekly or biweekly meetings mm -hmm. with uh, with with local businesses, and of course we get calls. Uh, and some of it is really putting our money where our mouth is. I've had an event of my own uh, at uh, uh, at one of the establishments right in the Second Avenue subway constru construction area, you know, for my last uh, campaign for office. So I'm. I'm both in terms of my personal activity as well as my, my, my job activity, really trying to support the local businesses, even if it means you know, making sure that I personally, through my, my campaign, are able to bring people to local businesses. And a lot of you mentioned people surprised, but a lot of people can't believe the Second Avenue subway construction is actually happening. They mm -hmm. still even If they don't live there, they think that it's just something that, they, that really is never going to happen. And people are amazed when they see the destruction uh, that, that, is, that has occurred. And as you say... About a quarter or a fifth of the businesses in the zone where, where the construction started in the East 90s have gone out of business during the pendency of, the, of, of this construction. Yeah, it's very tragic. Um, but, yeah, it will. Everyone agrees that it's, it's needed. Um, but when you have a Lexington Avenue line that operates at 150% of capacity mm -hmm. on a weekday basis, you, you can't have that. The, the potential for disaster, not, not talking about a major uh, terrorist event or something of that nature, but just a, a, a run-of-the-mill fire or, or switching problem or derailment uh, j could, would just be a potential disaster. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, just it's, just, it's not efficient where you have... The West Side has, has multiple subway lines to, to fulfill their needs, to have only one on the East Side, and you know, to, to move towards a position where, you're gonna, where it's going to be like, or almost like Tokyo, where you have people whose job it is is to push people <laughs> into the subway car. We, we can't have that happen, and it, mm -hmm. it's dangerous, it's, it's not safe, and uh, we need to, to, and due to the work of Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, uh, the funding is there to move forward with the first stage of the subway construction, and that's what we're doing in as timely and efficient and safe a manner as can be. Um, now, where a lot of the issues the Upper East City have to do with congestion and crowding, mm -hmm. and there is um, one important issue for everybody is the uh, preservation of, of any open space, mm -hmm. which we have virtually none. Right. Um, we have a few small parks, and I guess I guess one of the um, um, uh, concerns about cons um, preserving what park space we have. Now, can you speak to some of the mm -hmm. um, some of those issues? Well, park space, Community Board 8 has the lowest amount of parkland of any community board in the city. Of all 59 in the city, Community Board 8 is last. And that's even including a big rock in the middle of the East River, which, which has a park on it that, 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 that uh, is determined to be part of Community Board 8. So it really is desperate. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, I've been very involved, along with Councilman Dan Garodnik, in trying to preserve Rupert Playground on the Upper East Side. Uh, about 25 years ago, the city made a deal with, with Related, the large construction company, that if they kept a certain parcel of land as a park for 25 years, they could do what they wanted to do with it after that period. Uh, that period has expired. 
related. Uh, we're still looking at the legal options, but probably has the ability to do what it wants to do with that park and could build a building there. We're working with anybody we can think of in the mayor's office, uh, Speaker Quinn's office, uh, related, anybody we can t talk to in order to try and preserve this playground. Because there are very few oases on the east side where somebody can just sit down, not have to worry about traffic, not have to worry about uh, about being uh, just, just being able to be in a in a in a quiet place, uh, or even as with regard to rural playground, to have a tennis court or a basketball court. There, you have a specific uh, benefit to not only for having some some park benches, but also active playground space, which really exists nowhere else on the Upper East Side. So we're working very hard with that. But generally, I've been very supportive of of open space and parks. Received an award from the Parks Department this summer for my. Uh, act action on behalf of parks in New York City uh, helped fund playground associates in a couple of local parks this summer, mm -hmm. so that children could go and have have somebody to organize events and games and things with them. So it's very important. Um, New York City can be a very tough tough place to live. Uh, the Upper East Side, with all the events that have occurred, the Second Avenue subway construction, uh, the crane collapse accidents of last year. There's a lot of things going on. You really need to be able to take your mind off of things uh, and with a, with regard to rural playground have an active park space like that and that's why I've been very involved in this issue. Yeah. And again related to that um, with the uh, um, the crowding congestion because of the improvement of city life over the years and more and more people want to move in the area mm -hmm. and what's happened is the cost of living has gone up mm -hmm. and what's happened to affordable housing. Is there affordable housing and can it, Albany do anything about this? The, the amount of affordable housing, especially with regard to the east side, is dwindling rapidly. Uh, just during my, during my time in office, I've seen affordable housing development, such as Rupert Yorkville and Knickerbocker Plaza, leave affordable housing. Uh, we still have some. The Isaacs Houses, the, the, the Federal Housing Project in First Avenue, is still some. But it's really becoming a difficult place to find a, to live unless you are at either end of the economic spectrum. So we've worked in a number of different respects. Uh, as the chairman of the mitchell Lama subcommittee, uh, I, I worked to pass legislation that uh, would protect people in affordable housing and mitchell Lama housing. Uh, some of the bills were actually implemented. One of the, the major bills that I have been carrying having to do with a specific part of the New York City Administrative Code called the Unique and Peculiar Clause that allows a landlord potentially to quintuple rates upon disillusion from the mitchell Lama program. Passed the Assembly a couple times under my leadership. Hasn't passed the Senate yet, but Governor Patterson, uh, first Governor Spitzer and then Gover Governor Patterson, to their credit, have implemented that policy as a matter of course for the Department of Housing and Community Renewal for the state. So even when the legislature, due to the Albany politics, can't pass affordable housing uh, by both houses, uh, we can work to have the governor implement policy that maybe the legislature can't, can't do. You know, somebody who, people on the Upper East Side, especially in the East 80s and 90s, moved to neighborhoods that could not sustain market rate housing when they moved in there. They were really pioneers. They moved into, full, we, used to, we used to be breweries, right. a big brewery on the Upper East Side that became affordable housing. Uh, people were pioneers. They moved into the, the neighborhood. They formed neighborhood watches and beautification programs, uh, made the neighborhood desirable for market rate housing, and are now being told by some landlords, thank you for all your hard work over the decades. Now get out because we can charge people more. Those people deserve to live out their lives in the apartments and the neighborhoods that they've called, they've called home for years. And that's what I'm working to preserve. I think building new uh, market rate housing is fantastic. We have had a, a great influx of, of people. It's provided jobs for construction. It's provided new influx of people and, and, and new neighborhoods. Uh, the Turtle Bay neighborhood where I live now, when I moved in there in, in 1996, it was pretty much just a sort of transient business commuter. I moved there because it was two blocks from my office. You've had... You've had a tremendous number of, of families move in to, to neighborhoods like that and on the, on, on the Upper East Side, and that's great. But in terms of affordable housing, people who help build these neighborhoods so that they can sustain market rate housing deserve to live out their lives uh, in the neighborhoods that they've called home. Um, also related to that is um, with congestion and traffic and all the, the environmental issues of uh, Upper East Side. Mm -hmm. um, what can the state government do to improve the environment for us, um, apart from water or, or even, is there anything about um, air quality or, or what is it that can 
the state can do that can impact the people in the Upper East Side mm -hmm. with our quality of life? Well, it's it's both they're both positive and negative developments that have occurred with regard to air to environment on the on the Upper East Side. As many people who live on the Upper East Side know, uh, the mayor has proposed reopening the waste treatment plant uh, uh, at Asphalt Green. Uh, this is after it had been closed, after a beautiful recreational facility was built there. Uh, it's something that I and my colleagues in government have opposed, not because we don't believe that New York City and Manhattan should do, should take care of its fair share of, of its waste, but when you open up a, re a recreational facility and then are going to turn around and put large trucks at all hours of the day rumbling through the neighborhood, uh, going across a driveway that children and seniors will be walking across on, on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and all the garbage and the vermin and everything that commits to it, 500 yards from a public housing development, the Isaacs House in my district, that we think is, is, is a bad idea. And we're looking for ways uh, to try and, and curb or, or uh, try and, and stop this from happening. But we have taken some positive steps. We This year, at long last, we passed an expended bottle bill. Uh, up until the bill that we passed, uh, the, the, the definition of what bottles would be recycled was based on what people drank in 1982. Mm. That's when the definition of what, so it was basically the sort of the standard Water bottles, but now fruit drinks and sport drinks have become a big part in the market. Part of the market, those things will not will eventually be able to be recycled once sort of some legal battles are are determined. So something like that, cleaning up bottles off the street uh, and and making sure that people that that, that they can be recycled uh, and processed is something that we, we are doing on on a, on a statewide basis. Uh, and and the urban parks is part of the environment, making sure that uh, that you have trees and mm -hmm. beautification uh, and and. And, and playgrounds in order for uh, for people to get to exercise and, and, and improve greenery. Uh, earlier in the program you mentioned about the um, uh, need for more schools. Mm -hmm. um, talking similar to that uh, about the educational issues, uh, what what is it that you've been working on to help um, New York City's public education improve? Right. Well this year we had the, the issue with regard to mayoral control of the school system and I did support mayoral control, excuse me, I, uh, but I thought that it could be better. We did incre incre increase the oversight responsibilities uh, in terms of how the money is going to be spent. Uh, we made sure that superintendents were, were tied to a particular district rather than sort of being transferred all around. So I, I think that we, we, did make some, uh, we, did, we did make some improvements. But really when it comes to the east side, it's about creating more classroom space and, and new schools. Uh, we had a good victory a couple of months ago. Finally, uh, the PS 151 zone, which mm -hmm. had not had a school in the zone, it was a phantom school zone, a school, a, a zone without a school. Finally, after eight, uh, after eight or nine years, has a temporary home at the Our Lady of Good Counsel school uh, for the next three years while we look for a permanent home for that site. Uh, I've been working very uh, heavily on the uh, issues with regard to PS 59 and on, on 57th Street. Uh, we, did, we found a site for a temporary location on 63rd Street. That's opened up. The kids mm -hmm. who used to go to PS 59 are there um, now, you know, so they did not have to move that far out of their current uh, school area. Uh, I'm working uh, with the developer in the city to try to get federal stimulus money that's dedicated towards school construction. There is no project in New York City, which is more shovel-ready, everybody likes to use that term, mm -hmm. but is the, because you already have the students in another school, uh, that's the, and, and you don't have to worry about, about moving them at this point. So the school is ready to, for construction. Uh, it would create a new local public school as well as a new high school of art and design, which is a citywide high school, uh, and that's something that I've been very in, in, involved with. Uh, because that that's all so it's important to me personally because PS 59 where I currently live is, is, is the zone where my daughter my two-year-old daughter will attend school uh, someday so I, I'd like to make sure that uh, by the time she's ready to go to kindergarten or first grade that there's a, uh, a new school that's state-of-the-art uh, for her to go to. Um, with um uh, getting these these types of laws passed, what's involved in that? I mean, it, you've introduced a lot of legislation, mm -hmm. and some have gone into law. Uh, how long does it take, and, and what are the efforts? I mean, um, you have to work with others, and does mm -hmm. it goes into committee. Can you just briefly sure. tell us how that happens? Uh, you know, really, every the path of every law that I've authored has 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 been different. I, I have, as you mentioned, had the opportunity 
to author 60 bills that have passed the assembly during my seven years in office, and 24 of them have also passed the Senate and been signed into law. Sometimes they're created by significant events, such as uh, legislation that I authored last year that became law, having increasing penalties for fraudulent or improper activity related to the, to the construction process, yeah. uh, increasing penalties for those who would falsify records, as has been alleged with, with one of the accidents, as well as increasing penalties for those who would help people cheat on licensing exams for crane uh, uh, crane operators, uh, as was, uh, was uh, alleged with regard to the, to the 91st Street accident. Uh, other issues involve major events that have occurred in New York City. I've been very involved during my time in office uh, with regard to 9 the health of 9-11 cleanup workers. Mm -hmm. I authored uh, two, two laws having to do with expanding workers' compensation benefits for those who worked at the site in the, in the, in the years after uh, the tragedy occurred. Uh, other things are specific to the district. Uh, other things, uh, other laws, are when, when groups come to me and ask them to carry their legislation, I've done that on behalf of, of the realtors and, inter and interior designers and then lots of different uh, lots of different groups. So, really, and it, it, it's a process where you figure out who the players are in order to get your legislation done, and you work with the groups that are that are supportive of it, uh, and the legislators who will see it along its path and try to to to, to make the legislation go forward. Now we're running short on time. Mm -hmm. One thing we definitely want to ask you is, what are the goals um, you want to achieve for the rest of your term? Mm -hmm. Well, I I. I think probably the, the, the biggest issue that, that in terms of community is helping out the local businesses in the 2nd Avenue subway construction area. Uh, that is something that I, I would like to really see my legislation move forward uh, and get passed uh, either later this year or next year to make sure that these businesses can, can, can get the help they need in order to survive. Uh, again, in, uh, finding new sites for educational facilities, making sure that we do achieve the financing, we're able to go forward with regard to the PS59 project and on East 57th Street. That's something that that's very important to me as well. So, uh, really, and 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 with regard to uh, uh, supporting tourism and the arts, that's so important to my district. Making sure that the state funding is there uh, in order to keep these programs going. Thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate the work you're doing for Community Board 8, the residents and the businesses, and uh, we hope maybe one day you'll come back and give us another report on, on the progress of your efforts. So thank you for everyone for joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you in our next program.